Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me today. My name is Jim Muller, and I am the director of the Sports Medicine Fellowship at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan. Today, we're going to start a three-part series on pediatric musculoskeletal issues. If you are tuning in for the first time to the pediatric series, this should be the first video that you watch. We will be discussing some basics of bone growth and maturation in today's lecture that will not be covered in the other pediatric lectures. So again, if this is the first video of the pediatric series that you're watching, then you're in the right place. Certainly there are too many topics in the pediatric musculoskeletal system to cover in a single lecture. So we'll be breaking these up into small groups and the entire series won't cover all possible issues. Goals and objectives today are to review skeletal differences between the pediatric and adult age groups, review musculoskeletal injuries and conditions more commonly or uniquely seen in the pediatric population, discuss mechanisms of these injuries and conditions, and discuss the non-operative treatment of these injuries and conditions. So to begin with, as any pediatric musculoskeletal lecture will, children are not small adults. Their bones are more elastic. They have growth centers present. Tendons and ligaments have higher tensile strengths than the growth centers at certain ages. Physial strength is inversely related to the thickness of the physis. And this was tested in a bovine model. 25% thinner space is 34% stronger with a 65% greater strain to failure level. So in kids, the growth center is often the rate limiting step, but as maturation occurs and that growth center becomes thinner and thinner, it becomes stronger and stronger and the strain to failure level increases. The increased elasticity of the bone allows us to see things like buckle fractures that we generally wouldn't see in an adult population where you see more full transverse fractures. When you look at the bone in a growing child, it is more porous than it is in an adult. This is because the haversian canals are more compact into a smaller area. As the bone grows, these haversian canals spread out and the porosity decreases. Bones in children heal faster and they have a higher remodeling potential and that remodeling potential declines over time. It's important to know the names of the different zones of the bones. In a child, the diaphysis is the main shaft of the bone, just as it is in an adult long bone. As the bone flares towards its ends, we call that the metaphysis. The physis is the actual growth plate, or you could call it an epiphyseal plate. The epiphysis is actually the end of the bone in a child. In the adult, there's just the diaphysis and the metaphysis. As the bone is developing, the epiphysis starts out completely or mostly as a cartilaginous structure. On the graphic you can see on the left, there's a small dot of bone within the blue cartilage. That is the first appearance of the epiphysis. And as that secondary ossification center matures and gets bigger, you have differentiation of that cartilage into either the epiphyseal cartilage, which is the growth plate, or articular cartilage. And then eventually, as you see on the far right, as growth stops, the articular cartilage remains as the cap of the bone. So moving from left to right in this graphic, the very young, immature bone on the far left has uncalcified cartilage and calcified cartilage on the ends of cancellous bone. The appearance of the epiphysis or secondary growth center then appears within this uncalcified cartilage. As that continues to grow, the cartilage at the distal end is the articular cartilage, and then the cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis is the epiphyseal plate or the physis. As maturity then continues and the growth plate eventually fuses and becomes complete bone, all that's left from a cartilage standpoint is the articular cartilage on the ends. 
when you consider the zones of the epiphyseal plate, there are immature components and more mature components. The most immature component is closest to the epiphysis, and the more mature component is towards the metaphysis. Just remember, mature, metaphysis. The order on this slide is from the most mature to the least mature, and the reason I did this is that the following graphic will have it in the same order based on the way that the picture was drawn. So again, we're looking at immature from the bottom going to more mature at the top of the slide. And again, that's to fit this graphic. The germinal zone near the epiphysis is where there is birth of the bony cells. The proliferation zone is when these cells increase in number. Then the hypertrophic zone is where the cells will start to enlarge and begin to mature. This is the weakest zone of the epiphyseal plate. It's weak because it lacks collagen, it's not calcified, and it has a weak blood supply. As you get closer to the metaphysis, that's when you get into the provisional calcification zone, and then eventually there will be calcification and maturity of these cells. I apologize because now you're going to have to flip your brain around a little bit, and we're going to put the epiphysis at the top of the page and the metaphysis at the bottom of the page. And as we look here, the reserve zone or the germinal zone is where the cells are born, basically. The zone of proliferation is where the numbers are increasing. The zone of hypertrophy is where the cells are increasing in size. And as you get closer to the metaphysis, which again in this case is at the bottom of the screen, that's where you have the zone of provisional ossification. When we overlay the blood supply to the epiphyseal plate, there is a relative avascular zone in the zone of hypertrophy, which is one of the reasons this is the weakest zone of the epiphyseal plate. So that's just an overview of the maturity process of bone, especially at the growth plate area. So let's start talking about some specific problems. But before we do, let's, let's talk about the things we won't be discussing today. We will not be talking about things like Salter-Harris fractures. We won't be talking about clubfoot deformities, and we won't be talking about hip deformities, and we won't be talking about avascular necrosis. We won't be talking about osgood slaughters or Cindy larsen johansson or Seavers today. Uh, those will all come in future lectures. What will we talk about today? Well, if we take a look at the pediatric skeleton, we're going to talk about slip capital femoral epiphysis osteochondritis desiccans of the knee and of the elbow, the proximal humerus epiphysitis, and distal radius epiphysitis. So let's look at slip capital femoral epiphysis, or SCIFI. The process involves displacement of the proximal femoral epiphysis in relation to the metaphysis. It is seen approximately 1 in 10,000 youths. It is more common in males than it is in females. Males tend to suffer from skiffy around age 12 to 16, where females a little bit earlier, age 10 to 14. And it's usually during a rapid phase of growth. Recognized risk factors include obesity. Race can play a factor, where non-Hispanic black patients, Pacific Islanders, and Hispanics have a higher rate of skiffy than non-Hispanic white individuals. A history of prior skiffy is another risk factor. And there are certain endocrine disorders which are associated with skiffy as well, like hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, and panhypopituitarism. The younger the age of presentation of skiffy, the higher the suspicion needs to be for an endocrine disorder. The pathophysiology usually involves mechanical forces causing damage at the hypertrophic zone of the physis. Again, this is the weakest zone. In this case, the metaphysis translates anteriorly and externally rotates on the epiphysis. Usually, the epiphysis remains in the acetabulum in its normal position. As you can see in the x-ray, this is an AP pelvis, and you can see the slip of the left hip where the 
metaphysis and epiphysis are no longer lined up. We often refer to this appearance as the ice cream falling off the cone. If you imagine holding an ice cream cone upright and the ice cream sits directly on top of the cone, that would be a normal appearance of an epiphysis sitting on a metaphysis. But when that ice cream falls off, that's when we are thinking about Skiffy. Current trends are that there is an increasing incidence of bilateral disease and decreasing age at presentation. We also tend to see a seasonal variation. A study was once performed looking at a, the sinus wave, if you will, of skiffy presentation to emergency departments. And the highest incidence took place in the months of July, August, September, and October. And if you consider that in most of the country, this was an American study, uh, the weather is good and kids can be outside and more active, it would make great sense that this would be the time where more cases of Skiffy would be seen. The peak of the curve was on August 17th. When you look at the seasonal variation, there are differences based on what zone of the country the patient lives in. Northern latitudes, where it tends to be colder in the winter, and summer may come a little bit later and the temperatures may not get so high. These are the open triangles on this graph. The wave is a little bit further to the right, meaning that a little bit later in the summer is where the peak occurs compared to kids in the central portion of the country, which are the colored in squares. So if we take a look, the colored in squares being the central band of the country, uh, the peak incidence occurs just a little bit sooner in the summertime than the kids who live in the more northern climates. And then what you can't see, there are some overlying darkened triangles. Those are the kids in the more southern states. But when you add those in, you'll actually see a double sign wave uh, because they're out playing sports uh, in the spring as well as in the summertime. And so the kids in the southern portion of the United States actually have a dual peak for Skiffy. The disease process is more commonly seen on the left, but may present bilaterally in up to 25% of the cases. If it's unilateral at presentation, contralateral slip often occurs in less than 18 months. This study from 2007, published in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics out of Indianapolis, looked at the mean age, age range, and number of girls and boys presenting with Skiffy to compare those with unilateral disease and those with bilateral disease. Nearly one in five of the girls who presented with Skiffy already had bilateral disease going on, where another 20% eventually developed Skiffy in the opposite side. In the nearly 60 cases, in males, almost 25% had bilateral involvement on initial evaluation. From this data, we can see that males are more likely to suffer from slip capital femoral epiphysis compared to females at a 2 to 1 ratio. And eventually, 40% of the kids had bilateral involvement. 22% had bilateral involvement at the time of initial presentation. Of the 70 kids who had unilateral disease at presentation, 23% went on to develop contralateral Skiffy. In girls, the average age at initial presentation of those who went on to develop bilateral disease was 11, which is slightly younger than the mean age of all the girls considered. Of the girls who had unilateral disease at the time of presentation, if they were over the age of 13, none of those girls went on to develop bilateral disease, where if they were under the age of 10 at initial presentation, all of those girls went on to develop bilateral disease. Likewise, the average age of boys who went on to develop bilateral disease was younger than the general mean age of all the boys considered. All boys over the age of 14 who presented with unilateral disease 
continued with their unilateral disease without developing problems on the contralateral side, where all boys who presented with unilateral disease under the age of 12 went on to develop bilateral skiffy. The bottom line is, the younger you are at initial presentation, the more likely you are to eventually develop bilateral disease. Kids with skiffy generally present with pain, usually in the hip or groin region, but it can be referred to the thigh or to the knee in up to 50%. They will often note it to be limping. They will have reduced range of motion, and they will often prefer to sit with the affected leg crossed over the contralateral leg. This makes sense when you consider that the metaphysis sits anteriorly and in an external rotated position to the epiphysis. So sitting in this position reduces the tension in the area of the injury. To try to put the patient into an internal rotation position will increase the tension in that area. On physical examination, limp may be the only finding. On careful examination, you may find that the affected limb appears shortened and externally rotated. They have reduced internal rotation, and there is obligatory external rotation with passive hip flexion, which is called the Draymond sign. There may also be weakness with strength testing or painful attempts at showing strength during this portion of the examination. This brings us to Muller's rule of three when it comes to kids and exercise. Kids don't just limp, they don't just get back pain, and they don't get exercise-related headaches. And any time a child presents with any of these things, we have to be concerned that there's something more significant going on. In kids in particular, if they present with a limp and any pain from the groin down to the knee, we have to consider the hip as the primary potential cause of the trouble. After careful history and physical examination is performed, we move on to imaging. X-rays should be performed, including an AP view of the pelvis, or you could get just an AP of the single hip, but I do like an AP pelvis so I can compare to the opposite side, as well as getting a frog leg lateral. Things to look for include widening of the physis, the steel sign, Klein's line and Throwen sign, and Southwick angle. MRI can also be of benefit in some cases. A widened appearance of the physis speaks for itself, but again, this is why I like to have both hips viewed on the AP projection. The steel sign is a crescent-shaped area of increased density that overlies the metaphysis adjacent to the physis on the AP film as seen in the upper portion of this graphic. Klein's line is drawn, as you see in this graphic. A line is simply drawn across the superior margin of the femoral neck. And in a normal situation, as you see on this diagram, it should cut through the superior most portion of the epiphysis. In the case where the epiphysis drops below Klein's line. That is a positive trithroan sign, and that is consistent with Skiffy. The Southwick angle can be determined on both an AP and a frog leg lateral x-ray view. The first thing to do is to draw a line perpendicular to the two edge points of the epiphysis. On this diagram, that is the line depicted by the letter A. Line B is drawn at a 90 degree angle to line A. And line C is drawn directly down the center of the shaft of the femur. The angles between line B and C is the Southwick angle. This angle can then be compared to the Southwick angle noted on the unaffected side to determine the degree of slip. If one does not have a contralateral hip image to compare to, then using 10 degrees on the frog leg and 145 degrees on the AP view as a baseline for normal angles is recommended. Skiffies are classified as either acute, they've been present for less than three weeks, 
or chronic symptoms have been present for more than three weeks. Stability is defined by the loader classification. If the patient is able to ambulate, then this is considered to be a stable slip, and there is less than a 10% likelihood of developing osteonecrosis. If the patient is unable to walk on the injured leg, this is considered an unstable slip, and there is an approximate 25% likelihood of osteonecrosis developing down the line. Treatment includes in situ fixation, percutaneous, single screw, perpendicular to the physis as seen here. Force reduction is not indicated. In cases of stable slips, immediate weight bearing is often advised. Complications include osteonecrosis, chondrolysis, and as we talked about before, contralateral slip may occur, leading to the recommendation of prophylactic pinning of the opposite side, particularly if the injured side is considered to be unstable, if the patient is younger, in which case they have uh, an increased likelihood of slipping on the opposite side, or if an endocrine disorder is noted as a cause of the skiffy. Moving on now to knee OCD. Knee osteochondritis is an injury involving the articular cartilage and subchondral bone of the femoral condyle. The most common location is the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. This is the case in 70%. But you can also have it in the lateral femoral condyle, the trochlea, or the patella. The adult form of OCD has a poor prognosis. A very common board question CAQ question is, what is the most common location of knee OCD? And the answer is the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. And I will show you this in x-rays shortly. The peak age for OCD is around 15 years. 11.2 of 100,000 kids between the age of 12 and 19 will develop OCD of the knee, with males having the process nearly four times more commonly than females. There are many potential ideologies for the development of OCD. Traumatic, due to repetitive stress causing subchondral stress reaction. There can be an ischemic component due to reduced vascularity in the area of injury. A hereditary component, which is suggested by twin studies, as well as idiopathic, meaning we basically don't know why. From a traumatic situation, it could be repetitive microtrauma, including the tibial spine rubbing up against the medial femoral condyle, causing injury over time. The events that lead to OCD and the progression of OCD includes injury to the subchondral bone with intact articular cartilage, softening of that overlying cartilage then starts to occur while the articular surface stays intact. And then eventually the articular cartilage starts to degenerate and separate. Eventually there's partial detachment of the lesion and in the end frank separation of the lesion with the formation of loose bodies. Patients will present with vague knee pain often poorly localized but often worse with activity. They may or may not recall a trauma Swelling can be intermittent and is often worse after more vigorous types of activities. And sometimes they will have mechanical symptoms such as catching or locking sensation. This would usually indicate a more advanced disease. On examination, they might have a limp. They might have an effusion. They might be tender to direct palpation over the femoral condyle. When performing your McMurray's test, you may note that they have medial pain in the knee with tibia internal rotation while extending the knee from 90 to 30 degrees. This is relieved with external rotation. When trying to determine whether or not meniscus pathology is present, tibial internal rotation would actually put pressure on the lateral meniscus, but in this case it puts pressure on the medial femoral condyle over the area of an OCD lesion. This test only has a sensitivity of 25%, however. So after a good 
history and physical examination is performed and you have suspicion for OCD of the knee, the next thing to do is get appropriate imaging. We start with knee e x-rays and a minimum of three views should be obtained. I like a four view x-ray series in my kids 14 and under. The series would include an AP standing view, a lateral view, a sunrise or merchant view, and a notch view. The notch view is the key view for trying to look for OCD of the knee. And this is another great CAQ question. What is the best x-ray view to see knee OCD in an adolescent? And the answer is a notch view. As you look at the x-ray on the screen, you can see the obvious OCD lesion of the medial femoral condyle of the right knee of this patient. This is where some people become confused when we ask the question, what is the most common location? We say it's the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. You have to look at both knees as you're describing what is medial and what is lateral. So if we start from the medial collateral ligament and move our way to the lateral collateral ligament, the medial aspect of the medial femoral condyle is directly adjacent to the MCL. And so as you continue to move laterally, that's where you see the OCD lesion. MRIs can be helpful for staging. And if there is high suspicion for OCD and the x-rays are normal, it can help identify a low-grade lesion as well. Here is the lateral view where you can still see the lesion in the femoral condyle. And here is an MRI image, coronal T2 image, which shows the subchondral edema, but you can see intact articular cartilage. Here is a sagittal view MRI, which also shows the OCD lesion. I always obtain MRI when I find an athlete with a knee OCD lesion because I want to get accurate staging of the lesion or grading of the lesion. When you talk about a grade one lesion, there's subchondral edema, but no articular cartilage damage. Oftentimes these will not be noted on x-ray or you'll get the hint of some shadowing in the femoral condyle itself. A grade two lesion, there is breach of the cartilage with fluid at the lesion bone margin, but this is not complete. In a grade three lesion, the cartilage is disrupted and the fluid completely surrounds the lesion. So this is a lesion that's free to move out if it decides to do so. In a grade four lesion, there's actually displacement of the fragment and a loose body. Prognosis is very good generally if you are younger at the time of presentation, and in this case you can see bilateral neocd. If your distal femoral physis is still open, that's a good sign. If the lesion is on the medial femoral condyle, that's a good sign. And if it's grade one or grade two, that's also a good sign. So if we flip that and look at the signs that have a poor prognosis, you're older, your growth plates are closed, it's in a location other than the medial femoral condyle, and it's a grade three or four lesion. Treatment of stable lesions, which would be primarily the grade one and two lesions in a young person with open growth plates, is generally supportive. Restriction of activities, restricted range of motion bracing may or may not be helpful, Crutch-assisted weight-bearing, particularly if the patient has pain with normal weight-bearing. Other pain control measures such as ice, heat, medications. Physical therapy to help maintain hip and knee range of motion and general strength. This can be done at home or in a formal physical therapy setting. And surgical consultation if these things fail to lead to improvement. When we talk about bracing, some have thought that if the lesion is on the medial femoral condyle, what about using a medial unloader brace like we use in people with arthritis to see if this helps? A study out of Boston Children's Hospital published in 2019 in the Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics took a retrospective look at children who were treated either with an unloader brace or no unloader brace. 
This was not randomized. It was based on physician preference, and there was no significant description on how the decision to use the brace or not use the brace was made by each physician in the study. There was a minimum of three months treatment. And what was found was that the kids who were treated with the unloader brace had a 50-50 chance of getting better versus needing surgery, where the kids who didn't use the unloader brace actually went on to have surgery only a third of the time. Now, it's quite possible that the kids who were prescribed the unloader brace had more severe disease to begin with, and so they had a higher likelihood of needing surgery. That is not known. But right now, there have been no randomized control trials for the use of an unloader brace in kids with medial femoral condyle OCD. For unstable lesions, or lesions that fail to improve with conservative management, surgical consultation is recommended. So again, an unstable lesion would be a grade three lesion because there's fluid getting all the way around the area of injury and that lesion is free to move if it decides and certainly grade four injuries. Now, in a small grade three lesion in young patients with open physes, a trial of conservative management may be tried, but in most cases of grade three and certainly for grade four injuries, surgical intervention is usually undertaken. Moving on to OCD of the elbow. Again, OCD is a localized injury to the articular cartilage and subchondral bone. In the elbow, this most commonly takes place at the capitellum. It usually occurs after the age of 10, where Panner's disease usually occurs before the age of 10. Risk factors for the development of elbow OCD include upper extremity weight bearing, so we see it a great deal in gymnastics, and also in overhead activities such as the dominant arm of throwers. It is believed that it is more common in boys than in girls. A 2013 report showed it to be a relatively uncommon injury, 2.2 per 100,000 kids, but it did show a six time greater incidence in boys compared to girls. A 2016 report showed a one-to-one -one ratio, and this could be due to several factors, including increased participation of females, both in gymnastics and in overhead throwing sports would be one potential reason. In this study published in 2016, in the Orthopedic Journal of the Harvard Medical School, the researchers looked at differences in clinical presentation of OCD of the capitellum in males and females. And what they found was a near one-to-one -one ratio, males to females. The mean age at presentation was 15.1 years in males and 13.6 years in females. And this difference was statistically significant. Also statistically significant was the ratio of dominant to non-dominant arm issues. In males, it was much more common in the dominant arm. And this would make sense when you consider that baseball was the primary sport that boys participated in at the time of their complaint. Whereas in girls, it was more closely a one-to-one -one ratio of dominant to non-dominant. It was actually a little bit closer to a 40-60 ratio. And this makes sense when you consider that gymnastics was the primary sport for the majority of girls who presented with this problem. And in gymnastics, you load the upper extremities relatively equally. More boys were multi-sport athletes than girls in this study group as well. And this also was statistically significant. As we talked about in OCD of the knee, the cause of OCD in the elbow is also considered to be multifactorial, repetitive microtoma, decreased vascularity in the region of injury, and genetics all playing a potential role. As we talked about before, the injury cascade includes subchondral bone damage with intact articular cartilage, breakdown of the articular cartilage with fluid starting to seep in underneath the injury area, separation of the bone cartilage fragment, and then eventual loose body formation. 
the primary complaint at time of presentation is elbow pain. It can be vague, but often is lateral in its location. The onset is usually insidious, not due to a specific single injury event. Many kids will have elbow pain that they've had for some time, which suddenly worsens. But again, to go from absolutely no pain to all pain in one particular injury is less common. It tends to be worse with the activities that put you at risk, including throwing and weight bearing of the upper extremity. Mechanical symptoms may be present, including lost range of motion, especially loss of extension, and catching, locking, or grinding, which often indicates a loose body, so that's typically a later finding. On physical examination, they may have tenderness to palpation of the elbow laterally, particularly over the region of the capitellum or radiocapitellar joint. Decreased extension, which may be painful. They may have an effusion. You may notice crepitus. Instability, however, is usually not present because the collateral ligaments are generally intact. Stability testing may cause discomfort, however. Just as we talked about with the knee examination and meniscus testing giving you some unusual findings, when you put a valgus load on the elbow, you compress the lateral portion of the joint. So a test that you are performing to look for medial-sided pain actually causing lateral-sided pain should raise suspicion of a radiocapitellar injury and specifically elbow OCD in the appropriate age group. After you've taken an outstanding history and performed an excellent physical examination and you have suspicion of elbow OCD, the next stage is to obtain appropriate imaging. You start with x-rays. Two-view x-rays are absolutely necessary, and I like a three-view x-ray of the elbow, an AP, a lateral, and I also like an oblique view. The degree of flexion in the AP view may be of some importance, and we'll discuss this in just a few moments. MRI, again, is helpful for staging of a lesion that you see, assessing appropriate size of the lesion, and to identify a lesion when x-ray is equivocal or negative. Then you can see on this x-ray the shadowing that indicates an OCD lesion of the capitellum. That's the AP view. Here's the oblique view, which you can see the shadowing, for me, in much greater detail. And it's much easier to tell that there's something going on in that area. And then looking at the lateral view, you can also see some changes in the capitellum. In this same patient, when we obtained MRI in the coronal view, again, you can see the changes in the capitellum. And then as we look on the sagittal view, you can actually see a large piece of the articular cartilage missing uh, in the anterior area, roughly around the 7 o'clock to 7.30 area on this view, and you see a slight elbow effusion. A Japanese study published in 2017 in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine looked at OCD of the capitellum in young athletes and compared findings in baseball players and gymnasts. On this slide, what you see in the photo labeled A is a sagittal MRI view of elbow OCD in a baseball player. And in B, it's OCD sagittal MRI view in a gymnast. And what they've done here is they've drawn out what they call the inclination angle. So you have a line going straight down the shaft of the humerus. And then what happens next is you take a line perpendicular across the face of the OCD lesion and draw an, a line perpendicular to the OCD lesion back up to the humeral shaft line. And that angle that is drawn is called the inclination angle. And you can see that in the baseball player, compared to the gymnast, the inclination angle is steeper. In fact, the inclination angle in boys averaged 57.6 degrees, where in girls it averaged 28 degrees. So the boys it was more anteriorly, and the girls it was more straight down.
if you look at three-dimensional imaging, again, you can see the lesion on the boy being more in the anterior portion of the capitellum and more directly at the six o'clock position, if you will, in the female. The reason for this is that when girls are weight-bearing on their upper extremities, they're in more of a straight arm position, where when boys are throwing, they're in a slightly flexed elbow position. The bottom line is when looking for elbow OCD, AP elbow radiographs may be more beneficial if they're obtained at 45 degrees of flexion in baseball players and close to extension in gymnasts. When grading elbow OCD, type one, there's intact cartilage. In type two, there's a cartilage breach and potentially bony collapse. And type three, there is loose body formation. Treating these individuals, if it's a stable type one lesion, you stop the inciting and high risk activities. In other words, you stop them from throwing. A brace may or may not be helpful. Physical therapy, either as a home program or in a formal setting to help maintain upper extremity range of motion and strength can be helpful, but rest, rest, rest is the key, and many of these will heal. In another study out of Boston Children's Hospital, it was noted that 53% of stable lesions healed with conservative management. But look at the average treatment time for healing, 8.3 months. No parent and no patient is going to want to hear that it takes that long for this to heal, but that is what has been found. It was also found that the smaller the surface area, the greater the chance of conservative management healing. Also, if there were no cystic lesions, there was a greater chance for conservative management healing. This group came up with a scale to try to predict healing. And if you look specifically at surface area as a percentage of the entire capitellum and the presence or absence of cyst formation, you could come up with a healing probability. So if there is low amount of surface area, and no cystic formation, you'll have a high chance of healing. Let's just make an example here. If you have no cystic change, you score two and a half points. If 15% of your surface area is involved, you score seven and a half points. Clearly my math is very poor, and it's not nine points that you would score in that situation, it's 10 points that you would score in that situation, at which time your likelihood of healing would be 80%. Math was never my strong suit. So, if you have elbow OCD present and it's considered to be a stable lesion and symptoms have been present for less than six months, non-operative treatment makes sense. You rest the athlete for six to eight weeks with some physical therapy, repeat imaging, and if there is clinical improvement and radiographic healing, then reinitiation of their return to sport can be begun. If the symptoms have been present for greater than six months, you really need to consider surgical consultation for drilling of the lesion. If after the conservative management, there is no clinical improvement, and no radiographic healing, then again, consideration of surgical consultation and drilling can be undertaken. If the lesion is unstable to begin with, then you're talking about operative treatment. A small size lesion in a safe location, debridement and microfracture is often the surgical technique of choice. In a larger lesion, in an unsafe location, fixation with bone grafting. If it's a large lesion in a safe location, then OAT procedure or OCA can be performed. Moving on to proximal humeral epiphysitis. This injury is an epiphysiolysis of the proximal humerus growth plate. 
it is basically a repetitive use Salter 1 type injury. And it's the shoulder equivalent of a skiffy. Sometimes you will have actual displacement, uh, sometimes you will not. It's most commonly seen in overhead sports, like in baseball, softball, and tennis. And in baseball, it's usually the pitchers. There is a male predominance of three or four to one. Once again, out of Boston Children's Hospital, published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016, Hayworth and colleagues looked at trends in the presentation management and outcomes of proximal humeral epiphysitis, or what people call Little League shoulder. Now, the Little League doesn't like that moniker. They don't like to be associated with injury. However, that is a name that has now commonly been used to describe this disease process. What Hayworth and colleagues found was that the peak age of presentation was 13 years, but it ranged from 11 to 16 years. The prevalence of shoulder pain in youth baseball was found to be about 10 to 30 percent, but the true incidence of this problem is unknown. You can see from the graphics that there is a bell-shaped curve starting around age 11 and tapering off around age 15. You can also see that during the course of the study, the number of cases of proximal humerus epiphysitis, which was diagnosed, steadily increased throughout the study time frame. This was seen almost exclusively in males. Again, the mean age at time of presentation, 13.1 years. Baseball was the number one sport in which this problem was noted with 92 of the 95 patients being baseball players. 79 of those 92 were pitchers. Catchers made up seven of the remainder and the remaining seven positions on the field made up the other six athletes who were baseball players with this problem. Again, symptom resolution took 2.6 months and return to play took 4.2 months. Again, this is a fairly long time for a young baseball player who wants to get back to throwing, but it's something that we need to know so we can appropriately prepare patients and their families for how long it will take to return to throwing activities. The pathophysiology is repetitive torsional and distractive stresses at the physis leading to irritation. This typically occurs during the late cocking phase, which causes extreme rotary torque. 400% greater than the physial tolerance, and during the deceleration phase where eccentric physial stress occurs. The number of pitches appears to be more important than the type of pitch. So as we look at the phases of pitching with wind-up, early cocking, late cocking, acceleration, deceleration, and follow-through, again, it's the late cocking phase and the deceleration phase, which most typically puts the physis at risk. If we go back to our physiology and maturation of bone that we talked about in the first portion of this lecture, the zone of hypertrophy, which is the area of reduced blood flow, is the area where the irritation most commonly occurs. So a thrower will present with pain, worse with throwing, improves with rest, it could be reported in the shoulder or upper arm region, but they also complain of decreased pitch velocity, decreased pitch accuracy if they are a pitcher, which is going to be the case in many of these situations. But what do kids do when their velocity decreases? They try to throw harder, which only worsens the problem. On physical examination, they'll often have tenderness over the proximal humerus at the level of the physis painful range of motion, actively and passively, painful strength testing. Glenohumeral internal rotation deficit may be present in up to 30%. The thing is, when you see this internal rotation reduction, you have to try to figure out, is this GERD, glenohumeral internal rotation deficiency, or is it a physiologic adaptation to throwing, which we often see? The diagram here shows a baseball athlete, as depicted by the hat, 
with 180 degrees range of motion, internal, external rotation. And what you see is that the external rotation is increased, but the internal rotation is decreased. The overall range of motion, however, remains the same. In GERD, the overall range of motion is decreased. So that 20 degrees increase in external rotation may be coupled with a 40 degree reduction in internal rotation where you expected only a 20 degree reduction to match the external rotation increase. After taking an excellent history and performing a thorough physical examination, the next step is to consider imaging. X-rays are the imaging modality of choice. Obtaining a three-view X-ray series is what I recommend. Contralateral views may be beneficial. And what you can see here in one of my patients is clear widening of the lateral aspect of the proximal humeral physis on the AP projection. MRI can be helpful looking at periphyseal edema. It can be helpful at ruling out other pathologies as well. If you look closely on this patient, you can actually see some displacement as well. So this is more like that slip capital femoral epiphysis uh, analogy that we used earlier. If you don't believe me, we'll just get a little bit closer on that area again where you can see some slippage that's occurred already. And on the axillary lateral projection, again, you can see widening and displacement of the physis. Well, how do you treat this? You have to stop throwing. Two to three months, uh, as you saw in the graphic, 4.2 months to return to throwing in many, many cases. Physical therapy to maintain range of motion and general strength in a pain-free manner is necessary. And this can be done in a home program or in a formal program. If GERD is present, then formal physical therapy uh, is recommended, as I certainly recommend it in that case. Uh, if motivation is an issue, I certainly recommend physical therapy as well. But if these kids want to get back to throwing, they should be highly motivated to do their home program. After resolution of symptoms and appropriate passage of time, then a progressive return to throwing program can be undertaken. Now, when I get kids back into a throwing program, I review with them some things that I, I think are important for them to understand. First of all, um, I want them to start at a low number of throws, a short distance of throws, and a slow velocity, although there is no specific definition of what that means. But the goal is to get to a high number, the needed distance to cover their position, and a 100% achievement of velocity. And so if they start at 30 throws at 30 feet at 30% velocity and they have no pain, then the next time out they can change a single variable. And you can see that the variable that we changed for day two in this particular situation was we increased the number of throws, but the distance and the velocity stayed the same. And then on day three, if you increase the distance, then your, your number and velocity has to stay the same from the day before. That way, if they redevelop discomfort, we can have a better understanding of what aspect of the return to throwing program caused them to have troubles. I also give my kids this return to activity recommendation Whereas you see across the top, if they have a return of discomfort, we have to look at uh, when that took place and uh, what it means. So if they have no discomfort during the activity, no discomfort within an hour or two of completion of the activity, and no discomfort the next day when they wake up, they can go ahead and increase a variable. If they have no discomfort during the activity, they may or may not have discomfort in the hour or two after, but they wake up in discomfort the following day. They probably did too much on the day before. They need to reduce that activity to a, a prior pain-free level and hold it at that spot for three sessions before trying to move up in smaller increments and potentially moving up with using a different variable. And this is an idea to give the kids some control over their return to throwing program. We also have a conversation in baseball that the worst position to return to is pitching. The second worst position is catching. The reason pitching is the worst position is obvious in that a pitcher has to throw on every play, otherwise the play doesn't begin, and they have to throw usually hard on every play. 
the position that then throws the most next is going to be the catcher because they have to throw back to the pitcher on practically every player, practically after every pitch, obviously, unless the ball is fouled off or put into play. The other positions are relatively safer, and there's debate as to what positions have more or less safety than others. But clearly, pitching is the most risky position for recurrence of pain and catching being the number two position for this. If we move on to distal radius epiphysitis, this is a similar type of problem to the proximal humerus epiphysitis that we just discussed. This is due to repetitive overload of the wrist, the weight bearing of the wrist. It's most commonly seen in gymnastics. The prevalence of wrist pain in gymnastics has been quoted around two-thirds of gymnasts will develop wrist pain at some point in their career. Overuse injuries has a high prevalence, 10 to 28 percent, and the incidence is up to 26 percent. A study out of the University of Iowa published in 2017 in Sports Health looked at NCAA gymnasts and evaluated men's and women's gymnastics over a 10-year period of time. The data, data is interesting in so much as we don't really see a lot of men's gymnastics, certainly in the area where I practice, um, but we see a great deal of women's gymnastics. Uh, if we look at the data closely, wrist injuries in males were quite common. In fact, the wrist was the number one injured joint, but that's wrist, hand, fingers, and thumb. In female gymnasts, there were several different areas with higher levels of injury compared to the wrist, with the ankle, foot, heel, and toes being the number one area injured and the knee being the number two injured area. But as we talk about distal radius epiphysitis, there are certain risk factors that we have to consider. And these have independent associations. First of all, the age group is usually going to be between the ages of 10 and 14. The age at which they start training is important. Usually the younger they are at the start of training, the more likely they are to develop this at some point. And the intensity of training is important, and that makes great sense. The higher number of hours per week that someone participates in gymnastics, the greater the likelihood they will encounter injury. The level of gymnast is also important. Gymnastics is often divided into 10 levels, with a level 10 gymnast basically being the highest level collegiate international level gymnast. They're performing the highest level skills, the skills with the greatest degree of difficulty. And again, the higher the level, the greater the chance of injury. Pathophysiology is microtrauma micro at the physis with direct cellular damage and inflammation in this area. And you basically get a fracture or stress fracture reaction at the physis, even though there was not a single injury event. It can lead to premature closure of the growth plate. So on history, you typically have an upper extremity weight-bearing athlete that presents with wrist pain. Usually it's insidious onset and on the radial side, and the pain is worse with upper extremity sport activities, specifically upper extremity weight-bearing activities. On physical exam, you may or may not see swelling. There is pain at the level of the distal radius physis, and they may have pain with range of motion. Strength is usually well maintained as is stability. After taking an excellent history and performing a thorough physical examination, you want to consider imaging. And the first image that you should obtain would be an x-ray image. And an AP and lateral film should be obtained. You should always at least get a two-view x-ray of any joint area that you're evaluating. I like a three-view. And depending on what I'm looking for, I may throw in specialty views, such as a, a ulnar deviation view, if I'm thinking of some type of scaphoid fracture or a clenched fist PA view, if I'm thinking of scaphalunate dissociation, uh, a uh, tunnel view, um, if I'm, I'm worried about a hook of the hamate fracture, so a carpal tunnel view can be helpful in that situation. So again, uh, I like a three view image. Contralateral images can be of benefit because, again, we're looking for some. So I apologize that we had to cut that last video short. I got to an hour. Um, they're just, uh, just a little bit remaining for the completion of this first part of the pediatric issue 
lecture series. So uh, we talked about obtaining appropriate radiographs. Um, and you can see clear widening of the distal radius physis on the AP and oblique projections here, and a little sclerotic line in the distal metaphysis as well. Uh, when you obtain MRI, you may see changes with, within the uh, physis itself where it appears irregular um, and appears to be narrowing uh, due to the possibility of premature closure. Treatment of distal radius epiphysitis is rest from upper extremity weight bearing, usually for six to eight weeks, as well as rest from other upper extremity sport activities. Splinting may be necessary to help with pain control, but range of motion and strength maintenance activities should be included. Once pain has resolved, an appropriate amount of time has passed. The patient has excellent range of motion and strength, then re uh, graded return to sport can be undertaken. There is debate as to whether or not repeat imaging is needed uh, during continuing care. Some would recommend repeat images at three months, six months, and 12 months because sometimes you can see changes within the growth plate indicative of premature closure. Uh, I personally generally don't obtain repeat x-rays unless there is concern from the patient or their parent uh, due to any residual problems. But again, if there were residual problems, we not, would not have returned them to play at that point. Bracing for return to sport is something that could be undertaken in gymnasts. There are wrist guards to try to help reduce the amount of extension during loading. There was a study performed in Queensland, Australia uh, in gymnasts aged 8 through 22 with wrist pain. These were all male gymnasts, interestingly enough, and no specific diagnosis for their wrist pain was mentioned. Region of pain was mentioned, and the trial included the use of a wrist brace to decrease pain while performing gymnastics. And you can see here that there was a reduction of discomfort with use of a brace on pommel, floor, and parallel bars. Interestingly enough, these patients were still participating with regular discomfort. Surgery is often reserved to treat the complications of this problem, which is premature closure of the growth plate. In the MRI that you saw, you could see that the growth plate was starting to close prematurely and the formation of physeal bars or physeal bridges occurs, which are small physeal closures. Resection of these bridges and ulnar epiphysiodesis and shortening with radial osteotomy can be performed for large closures. You can see in this graphic depiction that there is resection of the physeal bar. An endoscopy unit is inserted into the void, checking the bar and the physis. And eventually after the entire bar has been resected, a bone wax is placed into the void uh, to allow for spacing and hopefully continued growth. So to recap, young bone and cartilage subjected to trauma and microtrauma puts kids at risk for unique musculoskeletal injuries. Remember, kids shouldn't limp. Reported pain is not always where the pathology is. Overhand throwing is a high-risk activity for shoulder and elbow problems in the growing athlete. We are not designed to walk on our upper extremities. And always remember that rest is good medicine. I thank you for participating in this portion of the lecture series. There are two more lectures on pediatric musculoskeletal problems that will be uploaded for your review. Thank you for your time and have a great day.